the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't remember who the patron of storytellers is, unfortunately, so... Well, let's dive right into this, uh, starting with the title of tonight's presentation. What do we mean by baptizing the imagination? Stephen. Yes. Okay, very good. You who know everything in class, but I don't know your name yet. Uh, Tyler, go ahead. Um, a lot of people see Catholics as boring people and they take the book and they don't really go outside the box. And, uh, okay, people don't see Catholics as, as thinking outside the box. Sorry, you, sh you should have signaled me so I could repeat what, what Stephen said as well. Putting an emphasis on the imagination which is very much neglected. Very good. What about the baptizing part, Deacon? God gave us an imagination, so we baptize our imagination that, that, that we cultivate the imagination all for his greater glory like we do all the parts We of cultivate the imagination for his greater glory. Amen. Very good. All right. The phrase is... <laughs> Ten points to Gryffindor. The... <laughs> The phrase itself is used in passing by C.S. Lewis in his book, Surprised by Joy, which is kind of his spiritual autobiography. And he's referring to George MacDonald. So, but I don't, I'm not actually using the phrase baptizing the imagination as a, a biographical uh, lesson here. I'm simply taking the phrase, the general way that Lewis used it, and applying it as everyone has contributed well to the idea that something that's very important, the imagination. Well, as good logical people, let's define our terms. So what do we mean by baptism? It's the sacrament in which by water and the word of God, a person is cleansed of all sin and reborn and sanctified in Christ to everlasting life. And this and the definition of imagination I got from Father Hardin's uh, Modern Catholic Dictionary. And he defines imagination as the internal senses that can know absent sensible things but not as absent from the particular sense that experiences them. There are six such internal senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, and a general somatic sense of feeling. Now, ignoring that last part, which is slightly confusing and requires far more philosophy and theology than we're going to cover tonight, the internal senses that can know absent sensible things, okay? Absent sensible things. Things that are not actually present to you or your senses in the moment, but which you can know, which you can imagine. And applying a slight nuance on the way we use the word imagination, such as creativity, let's use as a working definition for what I'm talking about tonight, that baptizing the imagination means to bring the object or objects of the imagination into relation with Christ with a specific emphasis on creative, the creative and the fanciful. So the objects of the imagination into relation with Christ. I don't know if anyone at home is going to be able to read this, but that's all right. And I am convinced that dry erase board creators have never created a stable board. <clears throat> OK. The objects of the imagination and bring them into the relation, into relation with Christ. 
Imagination, fancy, creativity, isn't this all a bit escapist? And I want to address that right up front because obviously I'm not doing a two-part series on this if I believe that. And I believe Lewis has a wonderful little exchange on this uh, in his essay on stories and where he describes a conversation with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. He says, that perhaps is why people are so ready with the charge of, quote, escape. I never fully understood it till my friend, Professor Tolkien, asked me the very simple question, what class of men would you expect to be most preoccupied with and most hostile to the idea of escape? And gave the obvious answer, jailers. What is it they're afraid we're escaping from by using our imaginations? So why is it so important that we have a baptized imagination? Ultimately, because our minds are always going to be filled with something. Good or evil, our minds, our imaginations are always going to be filled with something. And this is not merely a matter of six commandment sins, adultery in the heart. And it's not only images, but it's ideas as well. Our minds do not sit still. They may never manifest in activity, but the mind itself is not still. It may not work well. It may not produce, it may not um, effectively uh, search for and find the truth, but it does not sit still. And therefore, it is critical that we baptize the imagination, that we bring the objects of our imagination into relationship with Christ. So with that in mind, with this impetus, with this uh, understanding of why this is something that we need to consider, let's talk then about stories in general. Let's talk about this genre, this way of um, manifesting our imagination, of sharing our imaginations, and ultimately um, of sharing ideas and ourselves. Why stories? Well, very simply, because God likes using them. God is a storyteller. In his introduction to the philosophy of Tolkien, uh, Peter Kreft makes an excellent point. He says, God must have known that literature is a more effective teacher than philosophy. For when he chose to teach mankind its most important theological and moral lessons, he did so not primarily through abstract truths, but through historical events, through acts. The Bible is primarily literature, not philosophy. Concrete, not abstract. It is narrative, not explanation. Now we know this, we know this very concretely through the parables. We hear these, and we're familiar with all of them, you can take, for example, the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower is a story. A bit more concretely for what I'm talking about, I should have put down, is the, the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the sower is a little bit more abstract than the other ones, although it's one of the more famous ones because it's the one that he explains probably most clearly. But if you think about it, the parable of the prodigal son could be made into a movie without any significance whatsoever. But we know the context of what our blessed Lord was preaching on and the point of that story. And we know that it is a parable that is, that is conveying a truth, but doing so in a dramatic way which grabs the uh, audience's attention. So in this then, let's consider uh, a question which is in, in the abstract a bit more interesting to um, academics and those who make their living by writing papers on this kind of thing, but which kind of is important for us to delve into a little bit as we're considering the kind of literature, the kind of stories that I'm talking about, and that is the question of allegory. Now, it's very interesting um, that I get my material here from the Holy Father. He's, uh, he's actually quoting in one of his Jesus of Nazareth books I believe it's the, fir uh, the first one that was published from the, the Baptism of the Transfiguration. He quotes the biblical scholar Adolf Ulicher on what allegory is. He says, allegory had evolved in Hellenistic culture, that's Greek culture, 
as a method for interpreting ancient authoritative religious texts that were no longer acceptable as they stood. Their statements were now explained as figures intended to veil a mysterious content hidden behind the literal meaning. This made it possible to understand the language of the texts as metaphorical discourse. When, ex when explained passage by passage and step by step, they were meant to be seen as figurative representations of the philosophical opinion that now emerged as the real content of the text. And again, we see this in sacred scripture. There's another example um, where, again, something, the story is representing another truth. Allegory, understood in this way, is a bit more one-to-one -one comparisons. But if you recall, what happened after uh, the affair between David and Bathsheba, and David had Uriah slain? Does anyone remember what happened right after that? Mm. The, the fact that there was a landowner who had guests, and instead of killing his own sheep, he goes and kills the one lamb that was owned by this, this poor man. And David says, that man deserves death. And the line is just it should, sudden chills down here. Like, that man is you. You know? Just, and then, all, you know, then, of course, David repents because he realizes how, you know, really how horrible that is. But that's, that is an allegory. That is a direct allegory, a pure and simple allegory. But it was not... Lewis or Tolkien or anyone else's intent necessarily to write a pure allegory. In other words, one where everything in the story corresponds exactly to uh, a Christian reality. In fact, if you look at, for example, the Chronicles, you'll see that except for Aslan's uh, death and resurrection and some major elements in The Magician's Nephew and Last Battle, there are really almost no one-to-one -one allegorical correlations uh, with the noble, notable exception of Aslan himself. Those of you who don't know, Aslan is the Christ figure of the Chronicles of Narnia. But it's very interesting. Lewis explicitly says in a letter that he wrote to uh, a Mar fifth graders in Maryland back in 1954, he said, I did not say to myself, let us represent Jesus as he really is in our world by a lion in Narnia. I said, let us suppose that there were a land like Narnia and that the Son of God as he became man in our world, became a lion there, and then imagine what would happen. Which is actually a good thing he says that, because the reasons for the incarnation uh, would, are different uh, than they would be for Aslan up here, the, the son of God being a lion in Narnia. However, it makes for good story and good Christian fiction. Now, it's very interesting, going back to the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, when he's writing about these allegories, it's in a chapter on parables in the book, the parables of Jesus. And it's very interesting that he says, um, he looks at the various positions scholars have taken and denies the unnecessary dichotomy between parables and allegory, saying that, quote, it is perfectly possible for parable and allegory to blend into each other. And then he goes on to give a description which is a completely acceptable description of Christian fantasy. Again, not something I was expecting to read as I'm reading the Holy Father's book, Jesus of Nazareth. It's a little bit of a long quote, so bear with me. He says in here, For Jesus is not trying to convey to us some sort of abstract knowledge that does not concern us profoundly. He has to lead us to the mystery of God to the light that our eyes cannot bear and that we therefore try to escape. In order to make it accessible to us, he shows how the divine light shines through in the things of this world and in the realities of our everyday life. Through everyday events, he wants to show us the real ground of all things and thus the true direction we have to take in our day-to-day -day lives if we want to go the right way. He shows us God. Not an abstract God, but the God who acts, who intervenes in our lives, and wants to take us by the hand. He conveys knowledge that makes demands upon us. It not only or even primarily adds to what we know, but it changes our lives. It is knowledge that enriches us with a gift. God is on the way to you. But equally, it is an exacting knowledge. Have faith and let faith be your guide. The possibility of refusal is very real, for the parable lacks 
the necessary proof. And that's the beauty of the fiction, is it presents without beating you over the head. And it can present more or less clearly. I know there are perfect, perfectly clear examples, even in The Lord of the Rings, which is the least um, obviously allegorical of any of the stories. But there are times in there when there are one-liners on uh, detachment from material goods or humility or these little truths which he throws in there because Tolkien is a devout Catholic and knows his spirituality. But he's not preaching, he's simply writing a story in, his, in <clears throat> what he considers an ideal mode. So there are two things I want to get from this quote and make it a little bit clearer before we move on. The first is what I would call fact become myth. Lewis wrote an essay called Myth Become Fact where he talks about all of the little myths that have existed throughout time that we see as hints of the coming of Christ. Um, Mark Lowry wrote in his essay, Myth Become Fact, he says, various myths exist either as anticipations of Christianity or as echoes of Christianity. And so we take Lewis's words, myth become fact, the myth of the deity becoming the fact of Jesus Christ incarnate in our, in our midst, and we turn it around and say, okay, we had these stories which are little hints of Jesus Christ, but now we have these stories which are echoes. Stories which then take that reality and carry out in different ways that are not the exact same thing. No one is saying that the history of Middle Earth is actually the history of this Earth. No one is saying that, but what he's writing is the realities that we see in a God-centered, Christocentric world as they might apply in this fictional world. The second thing, which is, again, this is Lewis's way of describing something I think the Holy Father was getting at, is from Lewis's essay called Sometimes Fairy Stories May Say Best What Needs to Be Said. He says, but supposing that by casting these things, and here he's referring to religious attitudes and beliefs, into an imaginary world, stripping them of their stained glass and Sunday school associations, one could make them for the first time appear in their real potency. Could one not thus steal past those watchful dragons? Watchful dragons, the dragons of secularism, materialism, the dragons that we assimilate simply by being in our society, or you could use the biblical definition, the demons themselves. When our guard is up because well, this is more boring church stuff. Or you, you don't happen to like the particular preacher that's giving the message, and therefore, oh, there goes Father so-and-so again. The dragons are subverted because they don't realize what's coming. The message gets through in the guise that it's under, the invisibility cloak, if you'd like. It hides from that particular watchfulness. <clears throat> and the stories, and I'm going to talk, next week is going to be a bit more of the concrete talking about the stories themselves. Uh, we might get into it depending on how much time we have this evening. I think we're going to have a lot of time at this rate, but that's all right. Any questions so far before I move on? Anything that's confusing? Okay. Very good. The next minor point I'd like to make is the fact that we are in a story. We can live in a world where we imagine that we're in control of everything. We can live in a world and ignore all imagination and equate reality to the dollar sign. But the fact is, is that we are in a story. And why is it a story? Because there is an author. And that author already knows the ending because to him it's already happened. Now, we've got free will, of course, but that doesn't mean it isn't a story. It doesn't mean that there isn't a plot, that there aren't conflicts, but that there will not be a resolution either. And we're in this story, and I think that there's a very beautiful uh, way of saying this from The Two Towers, the second of the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. You may be familiar with it. They did a, a pretty good job putting it in the movie, uh, although I, I say that because they messed up so many other things, but 
this particular thing they did well. And I'm going to try and read it, and I'm going to try not to overact the voice because I can't do it. But I'm tempted to because it's so tempting. <laughs> so this is Frodo and Sam, two of the main characters, as they are wandering through um, Mordor, trying, or they're approaching Mordor, I think is this particular point, where everything is bleak and there does not seem to be a lot of hope for their quest. And I think we're starting off with um, Sam, yes. So Sam says, Still, I wonder if we shall ever be put into songs or tales. Or in one, of course, but I mean put into words, you know, told by the fireside or read out of a great big book with red and black letters. Years and years afterwards. And people will say, let's hear about Frodo and the ring. And they will say, yes, that's one of my favorites. Frodo was very brave, wasn't he, Dad? Yes, my boy, the famousest of all hobbits. And that's saying a lot. It's saying a lot too much, said Frodo, and he laughed, a long, clear laugh from his heart. Such a sound had not been heard in those places since Sauron came to Middle-earth. To Sam, suddenly, it seemed as if all the stones were listening and the tall rocks leaning over them. But Frodo did not heed them. He laughed again. Why, Sam, he said, to hear you somehow makes me as merry as if the story was already written. But you've left out one of the chief characters, Samwise the Stout-Hearted. I want to hear more about Sam, Dad. Why didn't they put in more of his talk, Dad? That's what I like. It makes me laugh. And Frodo wouldn't have got far without Sam, would he, Dad? Now, Mr. Frodo, said Sam, you shouldn't make fun. I was serious. So was I, said Frodo, and so I am. And it's in times like this that it's most difficult, but also the most important to remember that the story is already written, that the triumph has already been won, that we merely have to play out our part in it. Because it's one thing once you've read The Lord of the Rings once, to say, okay, I know how it ends. If you don't know how it ends, I'll try and spare you, but if you haven't read it by now, shame on you. <laughs> All right, get back to The Lord of the Rings and read it. One of the best pieces of literature you're going to read, not just because it was written by an English professor who could use words as well as I use Lego, but because he was steeped in his Catholicism, and without beating us over the head with it, he presents it so beautifully in the story. So that's one, again, minor point that I want to say. But again, it's important because if we only look at our lives in terms of earthly goals, of money, of, of position, or anything measurable, we forget the bigger picture. The second minor point I want to make before moving on to the last large portion here is these stories give us a common experience. Kreft says that philosophy makes literature clear. Literature makes philosophy real. He calls it a laboratory, that we can create a scenario. If you want to know what's wrong with, oh, I don't know, communism, you write something called Animal Farm, right? We don't, we don't believe that there really was a farm of animals that did this. You know, it's fairly you know, woodenly allegorical, but it makes the point. But it also shows something which may not be seen otherwise. Because it makes it more believable, it makes it more real, it gives flesh to an idea. Lewis says in his book, The Four Loves, <clears throat> I am driven to literary examples because you, the reader, and I do not live in the same neighborhood. If we did, there would be, unfortunately, no difficulty about replacing them with examples from your life. And here he's talking about, I think, is a, a grouchy old woman. But <clears throat> the fact is, is that it's so much easier with this shared experience. So, for example, a priest friend of mine was having a pretty bad time. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly what the, the situation was, and even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. But he was, you know, not doing too well, you know, a bit under some spiritual attack emotionally down, and all he had to say was that he felt like he had been attacked by dementors. And of course, those of you who are not laughing do not know your Harry Potter well enough, so you need to read those. But they know because there's the, the, these characters which sap the happiness out of every place they are. 
And the descriptions, of course, are so clear in the story and the effect in the story that all he has to say is Dementors and I know exactly how he feels. This is especially important for guys, by the way. <laughs> now, just a quick allegory because we're doing great on time and I think you'll appreciate this. Um, so this, this, this priest friend of mine being a, a Harry Potter fan uh, had to go see Bishop Corrada because something was not going well and he needs some fatherly advice and some support. And so they went and they talked and then they went to IHOP. And, and uh, father said, I almost said his name, father said, yes, we need something to drive the Dementors away. And the bishop, of course, is, what? <laughs> Although Bishop Corrada actually made time to read fiction every week. There was a point in seminary where, where everyone was criticizing me for focusing too much on fiction. I, and when he asked me about it, I said, Your Excellency, it's not like I put time aside for it. He said, well, I put time aside every week to read fiction. I said, great. <laughs> anyway, so they, they go to IHOP, they order, and he says, and uh, as they're ordering, you know, very sweet pancakes, the bishop says to the waitress, it's to drive the dementors away. <laughs> <laughs> and the waitress, being Potter trained, didn't miss a beat. She said, well, they would need to be chocolate for that. <laughs> it was a beautiful little story. But, okay, so there's a common experience. Again, if you know Potter, you understand the chocolate reference. Uh, actually, if you like chocolate, you understand the chocolate <laughs> reference. <laughs> uh, it's a common experience. It's being able to say, in this situation, you know, I, I can relate. But it also works on an individual basis. I should have brought it with me. Maybe I'll remember uh, next time. There's this scene in The Lord of the Rings where Gandalf is on the bridge of Hazadum, which is like two feet wide with, you know, thousands of feet drop on either side. And he's facing this demon of flame that's towering over him with a flaming sword, big bat wings, breathing fire. And he's standing and holding the bridge by himself. And I'm not going to try and act act out the, the words, although they're really good. They involve a lot of repeating of, you shall not pass, you know. But it's a, it's a great scene because of two things. Firstly, from an image standpoint, you can identify if you're trying to resist a strong temptation because you feel like short humanoid on a two-foot wide bridge facing this big monster. But the other thing is, is that Tolkien in his letters says that at one point Gandalf in his monologue says, I am a servant of the secret fire. He says the secret fire is the Holy Spirit. You know, something to remember when you're in a moment of temptation. So, not just common experience um, with other people in conversation, but I have a feeling Tolkien resisted temptation in his life. He understood that and was able to communicate that in a literary way. All right, very good. So that's a good stopping point right there for a pause. Any questions, comments, pious indignation, contributions? You're allowed to contribute. I'll let you know if you're wrong. Okay, very good. Uh, I would like then to talk in this last part here about possible objections. And I'm glad there's no one here this evening who brought their sword and was uh, planning on attacking. Um, but let's talk about some objections to this, not so much the idea, but more of the manifestations and how, you know, the kind of stories we're talking about. And the first one, and less volatile, is the question, well, aren't these children's stories? Aren't these just for kids? Um, the shorter answer is no. Uh, <laughs> Emphatically, capital letters, okay? Uh, and I would like to draw your attention to our blessed Lord. Believe me, unless you become like little children again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I have nowhere read uh, someone, uh, a father of the church that has said, what our blessed Lord means by this is that you must become a fan of the Lord of the Rings. However, there is a certain childlike quality to the receptivity of that. And in particular, again, a particular book aside, the use of imagination. Because what limits our imagination? 
and this is not in my notes, so someone please write this down. What limits our imagination is ideas which we have been taught, either directly or indirectly, whether in school by parents or just simply bad peers, that have stunted our imagination, that have stunted our ways of thinking as a Christian, have put us in a box which we shouldn't be in. And we have to return back to that more innocent state and being open, docile, uh, and accepting, and imaginative even. Now one book I will point out, this is by Thomas Howard, who is an excellent author. Uh, this is his commentary on all of the uh, works of, of Lewis, which was renamed at the time that the movies were coming out, Narnia and Beyond. But uh, we can't get past sales, unfortunately. But he has some very excellent comments in here about uh, all of Lewis's works, but especially, as I'm quoting here, on Narnia. We may call Narnia the forgotten country, that's the title of the essay, because far from being a whole new region, it is the very homeland which lies at the back of every man's imagination, which we all yearn for, and which has long since disappeared from view in the wake of the vessel we call history. Perhaps the only people you, you will convince that it exists, as in Narnia, are children and madmen. With them you might organize a search for the ruins of Ker Paraval somewhere. The rest of us will demur. Ker Paraval is the tan castle there. <laughs> The point here would be, however, that what we encounter in the landscape of Narnia is true. Not in the sense that we will come upon the ruins of Ker Paraval somewhere, there are none, but rather in the sense that Ker Paraval is a castle. And the man from whose imagination castles have disappeared is disastrously deprived. I want to read that line again because it's so good. And the man from whose imagination castles have disappeared is disastrously deprived as is the man who has lost the capacity to appreciate how it can be that for a free man to bow in the presence of a great king, far from being demeaning, is ennobling. If indeed the real truth about our human life is something like what all religion and mythologies and tribes and civilizations until about 200 years ago have suspected, then the stories that tell us about life in those terms would seem to be not misleading, but true. Ours is the poet's problem. How does a poet or a painter or a storyteller who finds himself living and working in this century, how does he propose to speak of such topics as sanctity or felicity without going back? That is, what materials can he work up from the familiar world of contemporary experience to show us what he wants to show us? The imagery that's used in fantasy literature harkens back to a time and a society in which these things are important. The things that we're trying to communicate are important. Honor, truth, nobility. And even though they may not have always been lived at that time, there is such a thing as concupiscence, they were ingrained in the lifestyle and the culture, often in dramatic ways. Do you need to have armor and a sword to be a knight? No. Are you going to mistake someone in armor and a sword for anything but a knight? No. These images are so important. You have, in other words, to reach back for your pictures, since nothing seems to be laying about that suggests quite what you want to suggest. All right. That's a lot of, uh, a little bit of my own commentary there, a lot from Thomas Howard. But then just a couple of quick lines here from um, Lewis himself. Now, you've got to remember. This is an educated man and a veteran. We're not talking about some guy, some mama's boy that lived his entire life at home until he was 60 years old. Okay? He was a soldier. He was married. He was an, had an academic career. He was a prolific writer. This is someone to be admired. And yet, he's the author of the Chronicles of Narnia and so many other works of fiction. And the same thing with Tolkien as well. 
In most places and times, the fairy tale has not been specifically made for nor exclusively enjoyed by children. By the way, when he says fairy tale, he means what we would call fantasy literature. We don't call them fairy tales much anymore, but the general fantasy genre. It has gravitated to the nursery when it became unfashionable in literary circles, just as unfashionable furniture gravitated to the nursery in Victorian houses. No book, this is, no, uh, this is a separate quote, no book is really worth reading at the age of 10, which is not equally and often far more worth reading at the age of 50, except, of course, books of information. I didn't read Narnia until I was 23. And now I've read them many times and I've got quite a bit of a commentary going uh, because they are worth reading. Right, okay. He says similarly, I am almost inclined to set it up as a canon that a children's story which is enjoyed only by children is a bad children's story. And finally, he's quoting 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11 here. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. Now, believe me, I've had to fight my entire, like I said, there, Bishop Carrada told me that my seminary formators, my pastor, and my peers all thought that I was too much into fiction, hence that conversation we had when he said, well, I schedule time to read fiction every week. So, um, and while I can always use better time management, I think the problem is, is that it was what I was interested in and not the amount of time. Okay, so that's one objection is the childishness in quotes of, of this kind of literature. Another objection that um, can be raised legitimately is a concern about what are our children reading, which as parents is a legitimate concern. In fact, I would not call someone really a parent if they weren't concerned what their children were reading and did not know what was going on. St. John Bosco, who is known for his work with youth, said that, never read books you aren't sure about even supposing that these bad books are very well written from a literary point of view. Let me ask you this. Would you drink something you knew was poison just because it was offered to you in a golden cup? Uh, I, in fact, anytime I hear people arguing about literature, and in particular, of course, this comes up a lot with Harry Potter. Oh, but they're so well written. Um, no, not really. They're not Tolkien. I mean, they're good, for, good and for what they are, and they're enjoyable and all that. But you know, they're not fine literature. You know, we're not, we're not talking uh, something that's that's going to go down in history for its literary quality. They have qualities for other reasons, but that's not it. And certainly, if there was a problem with a book, to simply say that because they're well written, that's not a reason to be reading them. Because, and this is very important, it's never just a story. It's never just a story. Every author approaches what they're writing with their particular philosophy. Now, this is more dangerous in books, for example, like the Golden Compass trilogy, where the goal is to show the irrelevance and then the death of God. That applies to other things as well, of course, but it's especially important when you're looking at books that are purposely being written for these purposes. I'm quoting Kreft here again. As Cicero famously said, you have no choice between having a philosophy and not having one. Only between having a good one and having a bad one. For it is one that does not know itself. So how could it know anything else, especially us? Whether the philosophy is good or bad, it's going to be present in the story. And so therefore, caution is always going to be required. Now, I wish I could switch it off. There are times where I'm sitting in a movie and saying, well, this is whatever-ism, and I just can't stand this, and so I'm sitting there miserable because I'm, you know, my, the shields are up. Um, unfortunately, it's just my temperament, and I'll have to deal with that. But, um, but it's present in so many things. 
it's present in so many things. Um, but I'm focusing tonight on a particular, a small circle of, of literature. But it is everywhere. You'll see it in your movies. You'll see it in everything. Advertising. Now, this is not the best example, but just do it. Just do what? You know? But, you know, slogans are used all the time to rationalize behavior. And the only reason we have those slogans is because we've watched a serial commercial 10 billion times. Okay, well, that concludes that rant. Okay. <laughs> Finally, um, before we go into the real Q&A session, and I, I'm prepared to move on tonight because the, the next part's the easy part. It's the just tell you what I know about these stories. Uh, right now, I'm having to try and be organized and intelligent about this. Uh, the last one, of course, is magic. And I know, thankfully, the fur, fur uh, Fuhrer, there we go. The Fuhrer has died down a little bit only because the movies are now over, uh, the books are not selling as much. I'm talking about Harry Potter here. Um, but I, you have no idea. And of course, being the fan, um, I was often the brunt of email forwards or, you know, objections or people turning to me in seminary and saying things uh, because they knew. And, you know, it was very good for me because I simply built up a thick skin. Uh, but um, there were a lot of objections. And the biggest one, and especially from the most vocal of the, uh, the, the Potter opponents, is regarding the magic. Um, so let's look at this because it's important for all of what I'm talking about, not just Harry Potter. I mean, you've got magic in Narnia, you've got magic in Lord of the Rings, you've got magic in a lot of our stories, the less well-written, certainly less Christian things that are out there right now, although, and even unfortunately worse, we, I think vampires and zombies have taken over the, the interest, and that's even more horrific. I could do a presentation on why uh, Twilight is an anti-theology of the body. <clears throat> but, magic. Okay. So, what we need to address, firstly, of course, is the truth. That is, what does the Catholic Church teach about magic? Okay? I'm going to read you the quote from the Catechism. This is paragraph 2117. And I'm going to emphasize a couple of phrases as we go through here. All right. All practices of magic or sorcery by which one attempts to tame occult powers so as to place them at one service and have a supernatural power over others, even if this were for the sake of restoring their health, are gravely contrary to the virtue of religion. These practices are even more to be condemned when accompanied by the intention of harming someone or when they have recourse to the intervention of demons. Wearing charms is also reprehensible. Spiritism often implies divination or magical practices. The church, for her part, warns the faithful against it. Recourse to so-called traditional cures does not justify either the invocation of evil powers or the exploitation of another's credulity. It would be helpful, I think, to supplement this very short and paragraph on the catechism. It's just one paragraph, because the other two paragraphs in the section of the Catechism deal specifically with divination, which understandably so, I guess, because I know as you're on 69 between Tyler and the highway, there's at least two palm readers up there. But that's another story. Uh, so in his book, Interview with an Exorcist, Father Fortea tells the reader that curses and charms can really work and that both are affected through the help of demons. He clarifies that no matter what type of magic is being employed, he's talking white or black here, quote, strictly speaking, any paranormal effect achieved through magic is accomplished through the intervention of demons. So, what is it that we need to look at when we're, we're reading all these books, these fictions which include magic? Well, there's two distinctions that are very important and that make it make or break the discussion. The first is that magic is not a supernatural practice in these stories. It is an ability of the characters. Remember, it's very important to make the distinction. If someone, one of us, is practicing the occult, if one of us is doing something in the New Age, Satanism, whatever, witchcraft, whatever, we don't actually produce effects. 
we can't produce effects. We, what happens is, is these people call upon powers, and the only powers to call upon are the demons, who then, by the permission God has given them to act in this world, are able to affect causes, in, or sorry, to affect effects <laughs> in the world. That is a very important distinction. Whereas, um, in these stories we're talking about, we're talking about the magic being an extension of their abilities. It's a little bit. It's more akin to um, mutants in comic books who have, you know, the ability to shoot. I know. I just <laughs> Deegan got excited. You know, <laughs> you know, shoot rays out of their eyes, or you know, heal super fast, or fly, or whatever. But it's part of who they are. It's part of their makeup. Um, and that's a very, very important distinction because it is therefore not magic in the sense of, def of the term as it's defined in our faith. Define your terms. Always start with that. If you're not agreeing on how a word is being used, you can't have a discussion. The second thing is that magic is used in these stories not just in the limited sense of making things happen quote, supernaturally. What do I mean by that? Well, again, Tolkien in his philosophy of Tolkien, or sorry, Kreft in his philosophy of Tolkien says, music is an essential part of elvish enchantment. When the fellowship enters Lothlorien, Sam says, I feel as if I were inside a song if you take my meaning. Music is handled in the same way in the Harry Potter world. In Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which is the original title of the first book, but they thought Americans were too stupid to read anything with philosophy in the title, Dumbledore says, ah, music, a magic beyond all we do here, after hearing the school sing their song. And likewise, in the Half-Blood Prince book, Professor Snape is muttering an incantation that sounded almost like song on Malfoy's sectum semper wounds. This extended use of the word magic in the fantasy sense that we're using it, is also seen very clearly in the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, in fact, it's, it's almost, um, it's even more pronounced in Narnia. It's in stone, in fact. Edmund is supposed, the traitorous Edmund is supposed to be sacrificed because of his betrayal according to what the White Witch and Aslan understand as, quote, deep magic from the dawn of time. Aslan is able to take Edmund's place and resurrect because of what's called, quote, a deeper magic from the dawn of time. Now, in Paul Ford's uh, companion to Narnia, his little, his little encyclopedia, he describes the deep magic as the demands of justice and deeper magic as connoting a self-sacrificing compassion. Now, the exact definition, of course, is not important, what Lewis actually meant. What's important is the fact that magic seems to be more than supernatural technology or occultism. And then, just as a last example, in the last Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, there is a wedding at the beginning of the story. And while I don't understand what she's trying to do here, I love what happens. There's a wizard up front as they're exchanging their vows. After they've in, uh, exchanged their vows, he proclaims, he says, that I proclaim you bonded for life. And then he waves his wand, making little silver stars shower over the couple, spiraling, spiraling around them their now entwined figures, which is an echo of Genesis. All right. That's the theory part of what I wanted to talk about. So that is um, culled from a, a number of sources to generally talk about the, the themes that are involved here as we're looking at fantasy literature and the baptism of the imagination. What I'd like to do is, there's plenty of time, I'm gonna move on with part two, but I first wanna take a few moments, uh, and I really would encourage you um, to ask any questions if something's not clear, or if you have something to contribute, if you think I need to expound a little bit more on something that I've said this evening, I'm quite capable of doing so, so. Please feel free. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, can you talk a little more about kind of just the relationship between like the literal sense, even of like a story, and like the allegorical sense, and how we can, how is it that we can really get at 
an allegorical sense, like from what the the, the you want so the relationship between the literal and allegorical sense in a in a story. Yeah. Well, unlike sacred scripture, I don't think. Oh wait, I can pull this out and play with it now. Good. Okay. <laughs> unlike sacred scripture, <laughs> um, there's only one author. Although my classmate and good friend, Father Jacob Meyer, does say that the Holy Spirit had to be involved in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I actually, I, I don't, that's not actually, you know, blasphemy. <laughs> These are God-given talents. I mean, God can actually say, you might want to say something about. But sacred scripture is different because sacred scripture is written by the human author. And I don't know that we've ever proclaimed that it was done um, like they knew that they were being inspired. You know what I mean? It's like, hmm, I'm going to write a biography of Jesus. Are you there, Holy Spirit? Good. Is this good? No, they, it's not written that way. It's the Holy Spirit influencing the writer in the way that the Holy Spirit does, subtly and um, without overriding free will or style or run on sentences in Paul's case. Uh, but um, but there's, there's what the human author is trying to say, and then there's the uh, sensus plenae, or the fuller sense, which, which includes what the divine author might have influenced in a particular way. You don't have that with Harry Potter, <laughs> uh, except insofar, like the authors of all these books, that they have received, of course, their own tradition. Uh, in other words, they have received what's been passed on to them, uh, to use St. Paul's phrase, in the tradition and what they've been taught. So I actually don't think there's as big a dichotomy between what's literally on the page and the allegory. I think that in a good allegory, or even if you're not do being perfectly allegorical, like Tolkien, he's, that was not his intention, um, there's going to be some of that that seeps through. And I think that goes back to more the fact of simply where the author is coming from. What is their goal in saying this? So I kind of address what you're asking? Yeah, I just have a, I just have a tendency when a lot of times when I'm reading fiction to uh, uh, read it and be like, you know, get to the end and say, well, that's a nice story. And then somebody say, oh, did you catch all these things? Like, <laughs> uh, I was going to say, is it? How did I miss this? You know, but, <laughs> So I guess that's what I'm trying to, how to, how to read it, I guess, with more of a... Uh, I'll be honest, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. Part of it's practice, though. I have to say that. Uh, just a little biographical perspective on this. Um, so, mention the Lego thing. Uh, back in 2001, I guess, I was first stationed in Kaiserslautern, Germany, as a single army officer with a lot of money. And uh, so I'm in Toys R Us, and I see the Hogwarts Castle set, which I knew nothing about Harry Potter. I tended to shy away from anything that was popular. But it was a cool castle, and money was no object, so I bought it. Well, one of my buddies, an Air Force uh, tech sergeant, um, was, I knew was a fan of Harry Potter, and I said, okay, can you at least tell me what some of these little things are in the castle? And he says, no. Here's the book. Well, needless to say, <laughs> that got me hooked. But then he also, after he knew that I liked it, he said, well, I've got something else for you. And he gave me a book, and I guess I should have brought it, uh, called The Hidden Key to Harry Potter by Mr. John Granger, who, classics major, former Marine, marathon runner, I mean, just very interesting. Did I mention Orth Greek Orthodox? Yeah, anyway, he's a very interesting character. And he... Uh, <laughs> He goes through and he talks about all of the symbolism and basically the kind of thing that you're asking, how do I learn how to do this? Well, in reading it, it's like, oh, that's interesting. For example, one paradigm which he brings up, we all know that the soul has three parts, right? <laughs> Can someone tell me what the three parts of the soul are? Close. You're, you're, you're giving me something to work with. Anyone? The intellect, the will, and the passions. The intellect, the will, and the passions. The heart, mind, and the guts. Okay? Or other organs. So, and that is used in fiction as a paradigm for character relationships. 
So I'm going to start with the Harry Potter ones and let you go from there. Hermione, the brainiac, is the mind. Ron, the flaming red hair and short temper, is the passions. And Harry is the heart. In Star Trek, the original series, <laughs> the head would be... Spock. 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 Spock, yes. Very good. <laughs> the passions would be... Jim Kirk. Yes. And the heart would be... Bones. Yes. Very good. <laughs> In the Lord of the Rings, the head would be... You got to think of characters who are most often the three characters who are together the longest by themselves for the biggest stretch. Say it. Sam. Which one did I ask first? Mind. That would be Sam. Heart would be Frodo, and the passions would obviously be Gollum. Very good. Star Wars. Next, we'll do one more. So, three characters who are together the most. Who is the head? Leia. Say it. Leia. Leia. The passions would be Han. Han, and the heart would be very good. Now, you see how you can do this? <laughs> you see any three characters together, you should be able to do this now. It's a classic paradigm because of the way they interact. So, was there another? Oh, well, three of the brothers, Karamazov. Haven't read it, couldn't tell you. Um, if you've seen Secondhand Lions, I'm pretty sure that the oh. two uncles and uh huh, two uncles and the and the boy are the th are three parts of the soul. Anyway, so he goes through and does all this. Um, one of the things which I learned in scripture actually is the chiasm, where in a passage you have uh, a parallel. So this is the beginning and this is the end, and there's a turning point. And there's a parallel all the way across. The chapter 19, it's either chapter 19 of John or the, the Passion narrative, which is like two or three chapters long, follows this chiasm. You will find this in, throughout the sacred scriptures. You also find it in the seven Harry Potter books. That each of the, each of the book, the first and seventh book have their parallels, the second and sixth, the third and fifth, and then the fourth is its own unique creature. Fascinating. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing you have to you have to you have to learn what's there so it's a lot like remembering that anything you see on the screen in a television show or movie had to be put there on purpose they're not actually filming real life this is created for you therefore it is put there on purpose if you think that way you realize that in things that are higher class than like Fast and the Furious, that you know there's going to be stuff in there. So. Why do you think the heart is always the, the main character or the center? The center? The center? Yeah. Why is the heart always the center? I think we just answered that. <laughs> because ultimately, and to be serious, because, and Lewis has a whole essay on this, of course, uh, and is, it's called Men Without Chests, is that the intellect override or the intellect um, orders to use the proper Catholic word orders the passions via the heart. Hermione's never going to get Ron to behave properly without the help of Harry. Well, passion, yes. <laughs> So, anything else? Before I move on then, just out of curiosity, how many of you, don't be shy, have never read or seen any of what I'm talking about? <laughs> Very few. Very few? Okay. It's all right. Are you getting, are you understanding anything out of all this? Yeah. A little bit, hopefully? Okay. Of, of what? <laughs> well, 
relates to, but they turn its character animals. And well, hang on a second, because that, that didn't hear you. Go ahead and say it again into the microphone. No. <laughs> oh, okay, good. The, the land of the fearings, like <coughs> Little Miss Much Afraid lives in the land of the fearings, and then she goes through her uh, series of waiting for her, her um, I wasn't her master, but the shepherd to come to get her, and then, mm -hmm. you know, and to rescue her, and she was too afraid, and she didn't come out when he invited her, and so then she was captured by her fears, basically, but, but it was a, a person, they had names, and then right. it, it, she had to go along this long trek uh, in these dangerous territories, and the deserts, and the, I mean, it was all... It reminds me of the, the Phantom Toll Booth, which, by the way, is, is I don't, there's not much Christian to it, except that it includes some truth, but it's really well done. But it's one of those things where, literally, the, they say, I don't remember what the line is, but Milo says something, and all of a sudden he just he jumps from wherever he is, and he lands in conclusions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it, it's, a really, it's a very interesting story. It's basically about thinking. <laughs> just think, just make sure you're thinking. Can you see me? Good. Okay. Yes? Now, would you say that uh, the fantasy is the, the noblest of the fictions uh, due to its uh, incorruptibility from the present world? Or would you say that? I would say, let, let's re reword that. Uh, your question to repeat for the audience is, would I, would I call it the most noble of the fictions? I would say that, I would give that a qualified yes. I would say that uh, fantasy has the highest potential, perhaps, because it provides the best opportunity to relate the supernatural, which is ultimately the world we live in. I guess with that, I really, I mean, that, that question really does lead perfectly into uh, part two. So I'm just going to begin that tonight, and we'll just go from there. So unless there were another question. Yeah, we've got plenty of time, so. Yes? You had said at one point something about um, the relationship of innocence to the sons of imagination. Um, ideas that we've been taught uh, from the sons of imagination, something about innocence. I wonder if you could... So innocence, the imagination, things we've been taught. Yes. Um, it's not a very profound point. It's just it's a fairly simple point. And that is, um, as Yoda would say, you must unlearn what you have learned. There is so much that we accept as true, which isn't actually true. But as I said earlier, we simply have watched it, the slogan on a, a serial commercial so many times that we accept it. Or we've heard a line in a, a, not a sitcom, but a, you know, some primetime drama so often that it sinks in. I remember to my embarrassment one time, someone was asking me a relationship question and I answered it and I said, whoa, stop. That's from a, that's from a television show, scratch that. But it's just, you know, without, without realizing it, I had accepted that. And so that, I think, is just an example of how we assimilate these things, mostly subconsciously. We don't realize what it is, its implications, and we don't see its effects, but we've accepted them, and slowly this little box gets built around us that is not of God, that ideas are fed to us that are not of God, that are not actually true. And so there is a certain childishness to letting those go and being docile and receptive to what God has to say. Is that why so many, well, I'm thinking particularly, of, for example, Narnia, where the only one that eventually kept coming back was Lucy, the youngest of the, of the Genesis. And I was wondering if there's a relationship in so many other, like you think, fairy tales or stories that we know from childhood involve children. Mm -hmm. Right. As opposed to adults who that's all been covered over to 
not only to justify my carrying a sonic screwdriver this evening, but there's this great line, which may not have been intended this way, but in the premiere of series five, when the new traveling companion to the doctor um, is asked by the doctor, well, why did you stop waiting for me? He said, well, I grew up. He said, well, you don't ever want to do that. You know? <laughs> now, again, I don't know what he meant, but, you know, that's, that is a very grown up in the sense of not having an imagination. Grown up and not believing in the supernatural is not grown up. I was going to add a quote to that um, by Chesterton. I found it on my phone, so. <laughs> Please, go ahead and contribute that quote. But, it, but it's really good. I think it speaks uh, similar to that. It says, uh, Chesterton said, fairy tales don't tell children that dragons exist. Yes, children great quote. Children know that dragons exist. Fairy tales tell children that dragons can be killed. And you, that, you have the sound to pick up on that? Right, okay, very good. Great line. Very, very important line. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to the um, unfortunate and his opinion trend <clears throat> in so much of literature that was given to children or students, let's say, um, where the dragon, the reality, what he was saying that children know dragons exist and they know they're bad, but that in this modern trend that was to make dragons, well, to sanitize them or maybe baptize them in a, in a secular sort of way where in so many instances they were blurred. And so what people instinctively knew about dragons being representing evil, because they were always evil, and uh, I think that was in The Hobbit where they particularly brought that out with Smaug because dragons cannot tell the truth. It's not in their nature. They lie. That's part of their nature. And so, and yet in so much of modern literature, they were blurring those lines and dragons were seen as heroes and good guys and all of that kind of thing. And so it was, it was kind of messing with minds now, that, uh, blurring that and everything. Do you know who wrote that? The Landscape Without Dragons? I can't remember his name. Smartphones. <laughs> Someone, please. Okay. It sounds familiar. Landscape Without Dragons. I need the author, please. <laughs> I'm, like I said, I'm pretty sure it is. Many, uh, Michael O'Brien. Oh, of course, Michael O'Brien. Yes, Michael O'Brien is the Potter hater that I keep referring to. <laughs> <laughs> Michael O'Brien, I think, is slightly an alarmist, in my not so humble opinion. Um, speaking as someone who wrote a story with a pet dragon, that you know, just yeah, nothing wrong with my story. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> yes, there, there is something to be said for, um, for what he's saying. Um, I think he needs some my doll or something. I don't know. It's, just, <laughs> it's, uh, it's bad. Uh, commentary on the fact that the dragons aren't always dragons, right? Well, that could be true. So, I mean, I think that in a lot of sense it's pointing to the fact that the things that are dragons in our life aren't necessarily actually dragons. So, it, while it might blur that, I think that it's an important thing to discuss in literature. I think that the mere fact of having a dragon that is not evil is not going to ruin a child's imagination. I think there's other things that might go with that. Um, he says the same thing, I believe, about the vampire stories that are so prolific. Um, but let's face it, we are all born with a disease in our blood that makes us desire things that are harmful. The premise of Twilight could have been phenomenal. But... <laughs> And it's a big but. <laughs> I'll just leave it there because I can't say anything charitable about that series other than that it was well written. Um, no, it wasn't. Hey, 
De gustibus. We can't argue. It's taste. It's okay. <laughs> the, re the response to that is, Father, your gustibus sucks. <laughs> it was I thought it was a fairly well-woven story. I was, if you didn't know what was coming, the first, sorry, the first one, not, not the rest, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, the whole idea of vampires trying to go against their evil tendencies, and yeah, great. Everything else? They don't sparkle. That's your biggest piece of the book. They don't They did. Yes. <laughs> oh no no no! That's not the worst. The worst thing in those books is Edward uh, proposing an abortion for his child, and that her friend have sexual relations with his wife. So they can have like a mole. Yeah, that was that was the low point that you know burned them, and I'm not a book burner. Okay, enough of that. Sorry. <laughs> The problem with the subject is I can rant on a lot of things. But yes, yes, that's true. Very good. Um, and actually, I don't mind that segue because um, we're trying to draw out bad examples too. That's not. That's not. I mean, because uh, the problem with this, the the kind of literature is it allows you to put anything in it. So we're going for the baptizing part, though, <laughs> not the paganizing part. So very good. Good. Mm -hmm. in junior high. And like Hannah Hermard is how I can relate. But it seems odd that these are written, written like for children, but they can't really be understood by children. I mean, the. Well, I don't. Are they written. F I don't know that Lord of the Rings was. Well, certainly Lord of the Rings was not. Lord of the Rings was a personal project of Tolkien, which got out of hand. <laughs> When you're when you're when you're a, a college prof uh, a university professor in, in Britain, you don't just write short stories, I guess. Uh, at least not not after a while. Um, you see, I don't. As a writer, I don't know myself that I sit down and say I'm going to write a children's story. Uh, I know Lewis, and again, Lewis, as the beauty of Lewis, and in some way Tolkien is they're not only writers, but being introspective people, spiritual people. They wrote about the writing process, and so, you know, they talk about their motives. And uh, there's a whole essay that Lewis wrote, which I, I quoted the title to you. Sometimes fairy stories say best what needs to be said. It's the genre to communicate what you're communicating. And that's again why I'm emphasizing the importance of this genre, because it does communicate that which is best communicated. What do you think? So even about. Because it was a science fiction television show, it's mm -hmm. set, supposedly set in the future, and they, and they were going off to different planets, it could say things about what was going on in culture at that time that would not have been widely appreciated in, right. you know, in a TV series set in 1960-whatever, Los Angeles, New York, whatever, but because it was set in, you know... 23rd century on the planet, whatever, then they could talk about things like racism and, and right. war and all these other things, and people would go, oh, wow, that makes a really good point. Yeah, really yeah subtlety was not their strong no, point back not. then. No, it was not. <laughs> but it was different, and therefore it could, yeah. And it's very interesting. I mean, I want to, I, even though I can talk a little bit about science fiction, it's not the major point here because. Well, Lewis makes a very interesting point. He says, the only reason to write science fiction is if what you're trying to say necessitates space travel and other planets. If you're simply trying to write a detective story that could easily fit Sherlock Holmes, to borrow off your shirt there, then write it in 19th century London. Right? You don't have to put it on uh, Riza. Well, that would be a different kind of story. Yes. <laughs> um, so that, in that regard, you know, now that's Lewis's opinion. It's not dogma, but he does have a point because he's a bit of a purist as a writer. Um, in that regard, you could, I mean, you can still have science fiction that's good and make a point, 
like you, you're addressing the racism. Um, um, if nothing else, is a good exercise in imagination. Of course, when you put time travel in, that makes it even more interesting because then you can you can do all sorts of things with that. Um, it's interesting though, just as a, as again a segue because we don't what are we doing for time? Oh, very good. Um, Star Wars is not really science fiction. It's fantasy. Yeah. Um, so I was just thinking that line in the little extra clip where he, uh, the doctor describes himself as the little green guy in Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's wizards in space, you know. Um, so until you introduce midichlorians and then you just kill it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, extra canonical, <laughs> even though it was written by the creator of the series. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, very good. All right, so I'm not going to talk too much about science fiction, only because uh, there is something to be said for what Lewis is writing. I mean, if you're, if you're running a studio and trying to make money, and science fiction happens to be popular, then you produce a science fiction series, but then you write what you're familiar with, and that is romances and dramas and mysteries and war. War's pretty good, yeah. You know, you, war's so much better when you've got spaceships and photon torpedoes and turbo lasers. But uh, I'm meaning Deep Space Nine, of course, not those other wimpy sh Star Trek series. Uh, now, to take this point, and we'll end this ton uh, tonight on this, uh, to talk about science fiction, Lewis wrote a less well-known but probably far more fascinating series than most people than people know of Narnia. This is definitely not for children. Uh, not because it's rated R or anything. That's, well, actually, there's some... <laughs> the, I don't know if the last one might be rated pretty high, but... Okay. Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, and That Hideous Strength. Now, without giving too much away, because I want you all to read these eventually, and it's worth reading, the point that he, we talk about is it's three different planets, Mars... Venus and Earth, and it's about original sin. On Mars, they never fell. On Venus, you'll just have to read. <laughs> and on Earth, we know what happened. It's the silent planet. So out of the silent planet is when he leaves Earth for the first time. It's the silent planet because Earth fell. And the, the fascinating thing about Out of the Silent Planet is that, uh, or sorry, that hideous strength is that um, basically you've got the good guys who are fighting this institute, the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments. Nice. Which is the embodiment of all the bad philosophies of the last hundred years. And each character at the Institute embodies a particular attitude. And you've got this poor, relatively innocent guy who gets caught up in this. Um, and then, of course, to add to the drama, his wife is with the, the good guys. So it's a very interesting. And then there's some, well, you'll just have to read it. <laughs> anyway, it's very fascinating. And it, everything goes back to the supernatural. You think, you know, that it's all natural in the city, uh, the city of strength. But... It keeps getting more and more supernatural until there's a, a, final, a final very supernatural climax. Not the end of the world or anything, but there is a, certainly all the supernatural gets drawn out in the final confrontation. So, so I'm not going to be talking about that series next week. I just wanted to introduce it just to talk about it a little bit and say that is a very good example of, of a use of science fiction. Now, it's even more... Uh, likable because it's talking about theology and original sin, but um, I'm a priest, what do you expect? So <laughs> there you go. Um, with that, I think it's probably best to stop there. I'm not going to go into talk about the other, the other uh, series. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. Next week will be much more concrete. Um, so unfortunately, that may not be as interesting for some of you who have not seen or read any of this. Um, but my main goal in part two is going to be to take everything I've said tonight and give you the examples, to talk through, you know, if you've never seen all of this in Harry Potter, Narnia, or Lord of the Rings, to draw out, hopefully with pictures and maybe even video clips, uh, that'll depend on how much Jason can help me with that, um, 
the technology set up in here um, to be much more concrete because I think you will see with the examples how valuable um, this is, how helpful this can be, and let's face it, it's also entertaining. It's the best form of entertainment. Now again, I can't watch anything without having the complete analysis on the whole time. So I don't, I don't get to relax as much as other people do, and so just count your blessings. But, um, but it's helpful to know these things and be aware of them, especially because you are responsible for people who are being exposed to them. And it's part of your responsibility to help steer them in the right direction. It doesn't have to be to Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and Narnia, but let's face it, you're going to give your child the best. So, <laughs> very good. Any questions? Anything to conclude? Okay, I'm sure.